We're going to hear from someone that in most places you wouldn't, in most countries in the world, I think almost all countries in the world, you would never hear from at a gathering of journalists. And it, uh, it, it reminded me that, that um, oh God, how old am I? Uh, so 38 years ago, um, uh, the press office was established 39 years ago. The official press office was established at the FBI. And the head of the office, uh, a man named Roger Young, uh, the first public press officer, uh, invited me, because he knew me from the outside world, he invited me to come to FBI headquarters. Um, and I found it and to visit the J. Edgar Hoover building. And I found that pretty amazing that is I could just walk in the building and actually walk around and meet people. As a reporter, uh, it started to make me wonder about the United States and really how unusual we are. But nothing was more unusual at the top that when I was invited to come to the CIA, which had established a press office in the 1980s. And, um, visited their campus, which looked like a college campus, and entered the front door where the sign is, the truth shall make you free. <laughs> and, and so, um, which in turn over the decades, I've been amazed at our ability not only to get files from the government of the United States, uh, secret files, or some, at times secret files, very few other countries anywhere can you do that, although it is expanding in places like the United Kingdom and elsewhere. And so I thought it would be useful now that we have an even bigger and grander uh, intelligence community that surrounds, the, uh, ac occupies the beltway in many ways, um, to invite and hear from the director, let's see, what is your official title? Director of, of Public Affairs at the Directorate of, Directorate of National Intelligence. And he, he's here to talk about how his office strikes a balance between protecting national secrets and engaging the media. And I can tell you that on the last project that I was discussing earlier in my remarks, he was very helpful. With that, Brian Hale. Thanks, Lowell. Thanks, everybody, for uh, including me today. Um, I'm just going to go through real quickly, since I've got about 10 minutes or so, um, sort of describing real quickly what the ODNI is, our role within the larger intelligence community. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our philosophy, uh, engaging the public, especially uh, post Snowden and some of the other developments that have happened in recent years. Talk about ways that in my particular role I'm able to help sort of work with the other intelligence community, public affairs folks uh, who engage uh, on a regular basis. Talk about sort of the shift in mindset and some of the challenges that you might expect you'd have with increasing uh, demands from the public uh, with regard to transparency. And sort of again trying to figure out how do we strike the balance between you know, maintaining the country's uh, critical secrets uh, and, all, and yet answering the call that the public expects us to do, which is to also be um, transparent on, on some level. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about sort of some of the limitations of that, especially since there's some foreign partnerships that we have and some of the sensitivities, whereas we may be a little bit forward-leaning, there may be some concerns with some of our partners. And then finally, a case study, I think, that I hope will resonate with folks here um, where we worked recently uh, on, a, on a project that I thought was um, illustrative of, of a way that we can, you know, strike some type of balance. So real quickly, without belaboring the point, the, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence was formed um, after the 9-11 Commission. We were, we're 10 years old. Um, we actually celebrated our 10-year uh, anniversary this past week or this week. and. Um, the, the big driver behind it was the fact that intelligence was not being adequately shared between the intelligence community partners, uh, obviously in light of, in the wake of the 9-11 um, attacks. So ODNI was formed. Um, it's taken, you know, as, like any other type of institution, there's, it's, there's been some growing pains and it's taken some, um, there's taken some time for us to be able to get sort of mature as an institution, but largely what do we do? Our job is to lead intelligence integration. 
uh, and that's across 17 different intelligence elements. They're the big intelligence agencies you're all familiar with, the CIA, NSA, FBI, Defense Intelligence Agency maybe, but then there's a lot of smaller uh, component intelligence agencies that are affiliated with military uh, combatant commands and, and, and different um, or military organizations, and Treasury, for example, as well, departmental intelligence institutions, um, agencies have um, their own intelligence functions. So 17, we're one of the 17. So our job in leading intelligence integration, what does that mean? That means we, our job is to ensure that the data is being shared, that information is being shared across, uh, across those agencies. And as you can imagine, the U.S. intelligence community is a massive enterprise. I've been in this role uh, only since June of this year. I had some prior uh, sort of um, nexus to the intelligence community um, through the FBI before when I worked there and then at, at Department of Homeland Security. But nothing really can prepare you for the massive uh, amount of um, billions of dollars of programs, uh, massive amounts of capability, and then just obviously the, the scale and scope of the, of the employees across the, in, the, in the global reach. So we're talking about everything from overhead architecture, the satellites and other types of things that are that are able to collect, uh, in addition to signals intelligence, um, human intelligence gathering, obviously, um, the human spine, and then um, other different types of what we call the ints, the intelligence, um, the ways we collect intelligence. So in, in leading that intelligence integration, the, the director of national intelligence um, is the president's um, primary advisor on intelligence matters, but also is in charge of ensuring that that, that information is being shared, he has some convening authority. He has convening authority to bring people together to ensure that um, some of the larger problems that they're not able to sort out on their own that he's able to uh, to, to work on sorting out uh, and along with his his staff. Um, so that's that's one of the big um, roles that we have. Also, the budget controlling the intelligence community budget, uh, uh, working with DoD uh, as well, which has obviously um, a say in uh, in how the, how the money is spent. So there's there's the budgetary. Um, authority that the DNI brings, and then finally, um, as the president's primary intelligence advisor, ensuring that the coordinated intelligence products um, that are put together and, and put forward for policy makers uh, in, you know, have the appropriate inputs and are put together in an effective manner. And I guess probably the one that folks are probably most familiar with is the president's daily briefing, which uh, we're in charge of making sure that the president is briefed uh, on a daily basis and that the products uh, that are included in that daily briefing are the, are the, um, are the uh, sort of most coordinated and have the appropriate amount of inputs. So that's sort of who we are. Turning to our, our role um, and where I sit, I lead a public affairs team at the Office of Director of National Intelligence, um, which is a, you know, we're, we're relatively a small team, but we regularly are interacting with the um, public affairs teams from the uh, other intelligence agencies. For, you know, CIA has their own, as Lowell mentioned, FBI has their own. Everybody pretty much has their own public affairs shop. So, um, and, and, and these are operational elements, okay? So they're the ones running operations. We, we're not operational, as I, as I alluded to before. But my role and the role of my team is to ensure that all those agencies that are part of the intelligence communicators, uh, intelligence community communicators team, are all talking to one another and coordinating. And so I see our function largely as making sure that if a call comes in for a from a particular media outlet wanting to discuss some sort of counterterrorism um, type of capability or operation, that's probably going to be FBI in the lead. Uh, there may be obviously DHS uh, being part of that as well. But I'm going to make sure that if there's any type of international nexus, if there's anything that has a nexus to signals intelligence, that also NSA and CIA are brought in. So a lot of what I do is sort of, I sort of see myself as seeing sort of the big chess, the, the big chess board and, and being able to sort of advise as to maybe the next move. Uh, again, I don't take the next move, but my role is to make sure that everybody's sort of coordinated and then if we are moving forward as a, as a combined intelligence community, that we're doing that in a, in a, in a coordinated fashion. Uh, also, my role is to speak on behalf of the intelligence community writ large. My team, if there's an assessment, an overall assessment that we have put forward, let's say, uh, I'll give you an example, the downing of MH17 um, over, um, over Ukraine. There was an, uh, sort of coordinated intelligence community assessment about you know, the, the facts behind that particular take, uh, that shoot down. So um, our job, for example, is to then put that out as a coordinated intelligence community product. 
So many times you'll see, obviously, CIA quoted on their, their specific equities or FBI and their equities or NSA, et cetera. But if there's an intelligence community assessment or if there's a, a major policy um, that we've put forward, an intelligence community directive, for example, that will come out of my office. So a couple of things um, real quickly. What we've dealt with most in my experience in, in, the, in um, coming on board here and even prior to coming on board here was obviously the a shift in mindset that's um, in, the, in process. And that's the best I can say. It's in process. We are at a place now where the public, as I alluded to earlier, expects us to be more transparent, to share more information about what our mission, what our missions are, and um, how we conduct those missions. Now, obviously, because we're dealing in a classified environment and we're dealing with maintaining secrets, uh, we have to figure out a way that, that makes sense. Uh, and I think that it's safe to say that there are many people in the intelligence community um, who, will, who will admit uh, and that, that things could have been handled better in the past with regard to maybe uh, effectively ex explaining some capabilities um, that we have and, um, and making sure that, well, it's the truth. So explaining and taking it to the public and right, explaining what the 215 program is. My boss, for example, has, has made the reference to the fact that we had explained what 215 was in advance uh, rather than it being revealed in the way it was, we, we may have had a different conversation. We may not have, but at least there would have been some, there would have been some discussion in, in advance about it. So it's safe to say in every single intelligence, per, uh, intelligence community leader that you've seen um, publicly, and by the way, if you want to just take a list, just go ahead and Google and see how many times the directors of these intelligence agencies have been, have been out speaking publicly in, in recent months and in the last year and a half or so, you'll see that obviously the, um, the shift in mindset is at least recognized that we need to be out there in front going directly to the people and explaining who we are and what our mission is. And part of that is also, the shift in mindset is obviously there's a challenge. You have people that have been spies, they've been trained from day one not to talk to the press, not to engage the public, and not to reveal. Well, as you might imagine, it's gonna take a number of uh, it's going to take some very strong uh, change leadership and, uh, and a recognition um, of the value for, for, of, of that prospect to be able to be a little bit more forward leaning. So we're in the process of doing that. I'm not always going to say that we've done, you know, I think it's too early to grade us on it, but I will say that if you go out and look and see the amount of engagement that we have been doing and, and that we are, we are at least um, making uh, strides towards that. I, I will say, however, that we, um, you know, we do ask for people's understanding in the sense that these are complex issues. And our posture sometimes when confronted with a revelation or a leak or something like that is to obviously, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, determine what's the best way forward. My, my advice to my team and when I have the ability to, um, as I do, to express what I think we should be doing with media is, is, is to basically find a way to assist reporters in the reporting. If we can't share information, and, it's, and if it's classified, it's classified. I'm not suggesting anyone go across that line. But if there is a way, let's think creatively. Let's, think, let's, let's bring in folks, if we can, and explain either the sensitivities or, when able, let's actually you know, provide information to guidance steer. So I, I try and get my folks to, uh, and, and they've largely been receptive on this, um, to, to start thinking about, OK, let's think about a way to engage uh, more effectively. And I, and I think we have a couple of challenges behind that. One is what I've said before, which is right, got, we have our own internal sort of resistance among people who've been taught, hey, you gotta keep stuff classified, and we gotta protect that. And so we obviously have to honor that, but we also have to figure out a way to say, is there some middle ground? Is there some other way? If we can't describe um, a program, is there a way we can describe a process? So, and, and sort of in, and help inform some of the reporting. We also have a lot of sensitivities with foreign partnerships. As you guys imagine, you know, this does not all occur in a vacuum. We have a lot of allies around the world, as Lowell alluded to, some of whom never speak to reporters. Or if they do, they speak to reporters only off the record. And that any official statements on behalf of their country and intelli the intelligence community only comes through their, their, um, their foreign offices or their ministries, uh, you know, foreign ministries or ministries of interior. I think the Germans, um, German um, domestic uh, folks um, are, are pretty good in, in talking um, to, to press and being sort of out there. But if you look around the rest of the world, 
you know, you don't see a lot of uh, public affairs folks representing uh, domestic intelligence agencies or foreign intelligence agencies. So what does that mean for us? Well, a lot of times intelligence programs cut across more than one country. They cross borders. We have to be attuned to the partnerships and the value of those partnerships. So where we may be a little bit more forward-leaning or uh, willing to engage um, media on certain types of, uh, you know, like let's say a revelation or some, some type of um, uh, intelligence gathering capabilities, we also have the limitations sometimes of our foreign partnerships. So, um, but I'm going to give you a quick case study before I, I, I go here. We were presented with that type of uh, exact scenario when, um, during the Mumbai reporting that Sebastian Rotella has done such an amazing job on uh, recently with uh, ProPublica. Um, Sebastian had obviously been reporting on, on, on Mumbai before for ProPublica, but then uh, there was a, in the Snowden Trove, the documents that were um, the revealed, leaked, stolen, you guys define it the way you want. Um, uh, and, but it, there was information that was out there. And uh, the new information that sort of made the, you know, sort of forced the reporting and, and sort of gave a different, um, provided a different sort of perspective on the actual, uh, on the events surrounding the Mumbai attacks and intelligence gathered prior to and during and then even after the fact involving David Coleman Headley and some of the other folks involved in that. Um, horrible uh, terrorist attack. So we were confronted with this. We were presented with material um, that we needed to um, sort of address. And so we sat down with um, the New York Times and um, with Frontline and with ProPublica over the course of several months and had um, some very um, frank and detailed conversations uh, about um, some information that some of the information that had come to light to guide the reporters on that. We even took the extra step of um, I went in and specifically made the case uh, along with others that thought there was value to declassify information. To say we need to declassify this and we need to um, uh, because it helps us inform the public around the world what happened here. So as you might imagine this is not easy to do. You have the NSA had uh, uh, equities, the CIA had equities, the FBI had equities, DHS had equities. Um, the, the intelligence community across the board, when you talk about a global intelligence gathering, ha all had equities. So you're, you're trying to navigate not just what do these different um, intelligence agencies think we should do in this particular matter, but you also had international partners. And you had countries, the attack obviously was in India. You had, um, and I'm, I'll stop short of saying who else uh, had concerns about this, but safe to say it was, this was not the type of decision that could just be made easily on our behalf. It wasn't just sort of the U.S. intelligence community or one entity determines, let's declassify, let's get the story out, let's help, the, help ProPublica, let's help Sebastian and the Times and, and Frontline out. It took a lot of work, but I think I'm using this as an example because I think if you, if you look at that reporting that the, the ProPublica of the Times and Frontline did, you'll see there's a lot of information there. There was a quick recognition that um, this information was going to get out um, and we needed to figure out a way to um, protect. There was some f conversations, there was some very serious concerns that the Times and ProPublica and Frontline took to heart uh, and I think they made tough decisions on their end. We made tough decisions on our end and at the end of the day I think you, have, you got what I consider to be sort of a, a, a case example of how it can work in a way that there's great reporting and, uh, and it worked, you know, in the, at least a recognition from us that we felt like, okay, we were forward leaning on that and did what we think was the right thing to do on balance, even though it was hard. Um, I think the, the last thing I'll say about that is it's easy to dismiss public affairs people as flax when you try and call. You have sources deep within the uh, apparatus. We know you have sources. That's part of the, that's part of the deal. We recognize that. Um, but I would say this, you know, it's worth the call to come to us to, it, um, to reach out to see if there's a way we can uh, assist. Um, in some cases, the value of the ODNI is that uh, we are able to sort of help our other intelligence community partners uh, if they're not in a position to, um, to maybe assist, there may be a way we can assist. 
Um, and there may be times when we just frankly say, no, it's not going to work. Sorry, guys, not on this one. Um, but I will leave you with the, um, with the thought that we recognize the value, and I've always recognized the value and the importance of investigative reporting. A while well, although we don't always agree with what sources decide to do, um, and as far as reaching out um, directly, um, it is what it is. And we, um, and we recognize that, and we're doing what we can to, uh, to work with you and, uh, and um, assist in your reporting when we can, and most importantly, doing right by the, by the public, by um, you know, recognizing transparency is the way we're moving. There's no going back. And we just have to come to the right accommodation about how far forward would we lean. In these cases, I'm, I'm not scheduled for taking any questions. But that said, <laughs> I'm willing to take questions at some point if Lowell will let me. Um, no, I'm kidding. But I'm available here to talk if anybody has any questions. Right.